Swami said to me very sweetly, it's good to make a fool of yourself sometimes. And that little eye in me became a little aware. Am I going to? God can have any name. I say Baba because it is through Him that I learned how to live with my heart, fully with my heart. And He has given a promise that whoever my eyes are set on, I will transform that person. If you have faith in that, one sentence that He has said, you will change, you will die while you're alive, and you will live it with God. Welcome to Sai Sojourns, a continuing series of interviews with followers of Indian holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba. Seema Diwan is a mystic, an author, and a longtime follower of Sai Baba. Her popular book, Sai Darshan, and others are readily available. This is interview number three in a series of interviews, and it was recorded in Seema Diwan's home in Canton, Ohio, October 13th of 2007. Our last interview, Seema, took place in April of the year 2004. That was wow. our second interview. This is our third. In those intervening years, what's some of the greatest new insights you've received from or about Sai Baba? <laughs> the greatest insights I've received in the last three years you know, one thing, Ted, <clears throat> the strangest part about my spiritual journey from the last three years has been I have looked inward so much that I've stopped looking at who's looking in, at inward, that, that I that's looking inward. So for me to actually speak to you and tell you how I grew in the last three years is difficult. Someone else that observed me could tell. Um, but all I have realized, all I'm feeling at this present moment from the last couple of years is that I've become a very, very happy person. I just feel very happy and I just, I, I, I have no reason to be happy. I just suddenly feel happy. I suddenly feel, um, I feel constant, not suddenly, I feel constantly intense love. And, um, I have no reasons for them anymore. So for me to go stepwise to tell you how I grew in the last three years will be difficult for me until unless you question me regarding my thoughts and see how we grew from my interview from 2004 to now. I'd like this sort of to be, um, we've discussed it briefly before I turn the camera on, um, a template for others to grow from in their own spiritual pursuits. So maybe let's just begin for a brief second. You spent many years, minus Baba, many years in the world of materialism, in the world of loving human beings, parents, families, and friends. But you didn't have, by your own admission in the earlier interviews that we did, a real heartfelt connection to God as you do today. And you, you're saying right now that you have this love, you have this happiness, I assume that means you have fearlessness, that you don't have too much fear in your life, and yet you're living in a very complex world that a lot of people describe as being a dangerous world. It might be useful to others to learn how they might be able to get to that a similar place one day if they learn from your own lips how you are able to turn your life around. The most <clears throat> important thing I learned is you go into different stages of loving God. First, you love God as a separate form. You love Him as a teacher, then He becomes your best friend. Once He comes to a stage where He's becoming your best friend, you usually confide in your best friend more than you confide even in, even than in your closer ones, like even your, than your husband or your mother or your... <clears throat> That's a beautiful stage. That remains a long stage your best friend, you speak to him constantly, you can get angry with him, you can love him, you can complain to him. <clears throat> but then comes beyond that stage where you don't want to be with him all the time. It's not being with God. Because you start, as you start loving him so much, you start realizing who is this I that is loving him so much. 
and you start analyzing this I now that is loving God and you realize that the I that is loving or is being best friends with God is not the real you. Are you understanding what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And that I starts dwindling and that I becomes a smaller I with God, a smaller I with God a smaller eye with God because you somehow first characterize God. God is good. God is loving. God is honest. God is that. God. But even those characterizations at a certain stage don't appear um, right to you because he becomes he and you become you and there's no way to get rid of that you if he's he. So that he has to go, for that he to go, that truth that you see in him, that honesty that you see in him, that love that you see in him starts coming in you. That appreciation of that honesty goes to a further stage of actually being, becoming you. And you start saying, that which appreciates God is not really a God lover. It's that, that which has to go. But you are to the outside world and still to many people trying to make this leap. You are, for example, a woman. Mm -hmm. You're living in America. Mm -hmm. You are a loving wife, you become a even, mother. Yes. You are a teacher to I your understand. children. Are you all these labels and then some? Or no. are you talking about being You're summer? in that in every. That little eye dwindles in every little thing. Mm -hmm. So much so that what you call me being a mother of Kern, Krish, and Shiv, those boundaries have broken. I see you as my little child now. I, I, I know you're older than me, but I see you as my little boy that has come to speak to me. Um, you start becoming, your love expands so much, and that characterizations of God come so much as a part of you that you do your duties even better than you did before. You become a better mother, you become a better wife, but you're not separated. See, ego is in fear constantly. When you're in fear constantly, Ted, you separate yourself into different ways. I am now Ted's friend, Seema. After Ted leaves, I say, now I'm Sanjeev's wife. Okay, I can be a little more of myself. Now when Sanjeev leaves, oh, good thing he went to office. Now I can be myself. You're worse because you have that I in you. But when that I dwindles, I have that same amount of love as I have for you, as I have for that same inner self, because I'm able to see that same self in you. That I has dwindled, it's not gone. I'm sure it's there. I'm sure he's going to still slap me with that little eye. It's there somewhere rotating. But it's become so small that I'm enjoying not as much as being with him, but being him. But there are times when you are living that small eye where you still have many responsibilities as a mother it to is. your three children. When, but I love, you know what? You start loving to catch that little eye. When you're, when you're doing, you see, your job as a mother becomes different. A normal mother will be, I'll protect my child. My child must come first. He should come first in school. Make sure you sit before this child gets this. Your entire thinking changes. You become a teacher to your children. You don't become a mother anymore. In that teacher, somewhere there is a mother who gives him food, shelter, washes their clothes. But when your children are hurting for whatever reason, how do you then respond? I laugh when they hurt. I'm kind of a very mean mother, that's why, <laughs> don't you're, I? You're going to have to explain this. Uh, I know that their eyes are very huge that time. So I usually laugh at them really loud till they really become small. And I think Sharda, you should take a picture of hers right now. <laughs> she has experienced this. <clears throat> when you hurt, it's because not something that wrong has happened to you, but because you have not understood that situation. Swami says understanding is a beautiful thing. 
Baba always says. You could tell him the worst thing. You could say, Swami, she's so mean to me. She does this. Swami will say, only misunderstanding. Is everything a misunderstanding that yes. causes us to hurt? Yes, everything is a misunderstanding with yourself. Because you don't know who you are, you are misunderstanding. Is everything a misunderstanding that causes us to be in fear? Yes, you everything know. is a, everything. Why do you fear? You fear because you are isolated. You are seeing something different from you. Hence, you are looking for your own protection. You are looking for your well-being. Yes, in the common sense, if you, if you look at the world, everyone wants to look at their well-being. But then we are not here to live in this world. If you're asking me these questions of how do I live in this world? No, I'm telling you the answers of how you're not. You're going to live in this world yet not live in it. Well, it seems to me when you go to the circus and uh, the Ringling Brothers, Bailey, Bartman Bailey Circus used to come to Canton and they'd pitch the tent. And in the tent were, among all the acts, a juggler. And the juggler would really captivate people's attentions because he could, attention because he could do two things at the same time. You are really talking about all of us learning to become a juggler no, with our small doing... eye and our big eye. No. You're catching your small eye constantly, mm -hmm. but you're loving your true self at the same time. You're not a juggler. That's completely the opposite of what I'm speaking. But it sounds impossible. It is not impossible. It is impossible as you grow in love. Why is it impossible for you? Because you have experienced love, but you have experienced a love that has walls in it, Ted, and you are not able to see the walls. But you are able to see it as expansive love. But I'm looking at your same love because you're saying it's impossible. I can see your walls. See, if you, if you look at someone who has never seen Bhagwan before or is not, and he says something to you that is impossible, that is possible to you, you will be able to see his walls, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'm able to see your you you have you feel you have experienced God to the fullest. You can't experience more than this. You have come, you have read so much about God, but God is not reading. God is not <laughs> words. God is not knowledge. God is not books. I write books, unfortunately, but God is not books. Mm -hmm. You know, Those are just triggers. See, Guru, what does God, Guru do to you? The job of Bhagwan, he's just triggering all your little keys to take you where he actually is. But he does that very successfully, too yeah. successfully. Beautifully. He's yes, able you must to, enjoy that too. He, I don't think I do. <laughs> I, I think in a lot of, I, I'm speaking for a lot of people who have their chains pulled by Baba, let's say. And it irritates them, it upsets them, causes them pain or fear. That's and, good. And people, That's when they have to experience that because they have to realize how much limitation they have in that path. And people ask me about fear because it's a favorite topic of mine. And I say, Wonder. I say proudly, uh, since coming closer to God and since really getting a chance to know Baba much more over the last 10 years, my fear is smaller now than it's ever been in my life. But. But what but, is fear? Do you know what fear? What is what? How would you define fear right okay, now? Okay. Well, what is fear? As I define it, I'm going to tell you where it still resides in me. But it's still the largest part of my being, and the fear, the classic definition of fear that I've read from reading books, is the fear that God doesn't love me. That's probably fear is a dependence on thoughts that you're so used to. Self-awareness of thoughts is fear. Awareness of the heart is fearlessness. So you have to grow beyond your thoughts. Thoughts are nothing but shadows. If you believe in your shadow more than yourself, you're never going to be able to do anything. You have to do it. Then only your shadow will follow. Like the dollar is the means of currency in this country, thoughts are the means of conveyance in this world. How do we convey See, ourselves to one another if we don't use our thoughts? There was a beautiful message once. <clears throat> once I was sitting with, um, next to Bhagwan at the interview room, and I was sitting by his feet, and I asked him, I said, Baba, give me a sandesha. Sandesha means uh, give me a message. Give me a message that, a one word message that whenever I remember, I'll be able to turn from where I'm slipping into. And he said, he looked at me and he smiled, 
And then he looked up for a second and he came very close to me and he said, don't plan. I just had my daughter share that with me last week. Don't plan. That is such an important, that particular thing has changed my entire life from that You day. make no plans. I never plan. And if I dare to plan, he unplans my plans in a very bad way, that I really remember that, because I asked him for something. When you ask the guru for something, you must realize that that gift should be with you constantly at all times, and you have to utilize that gift. And he himself will come to remind you if you're not utilizing that gift. We all are excited to speak to Baba. We all want to be close to Baba. We all may have thousands of interviews with Bhagwan. We may have interactions with him, letters. But we have to realize every look he looks at you, even when he passes you, even when he has spoken to you in a dream, it is extremely important. You have to take that message very seriously, and, and the it people, will happen. And do the people who believe he never looks their way? He's still looking at them. He says, I have a thousand eyes. He once described in my, last time I spoke to him, he um, waited till the last day. And in the morning, that morning, I felt, I don't think he's going to call us. And I went eating my breakfast, and that the breakfast was just not going down my throat. So in the evening when he called us, the first thing he said, stress, stressed, he said to me, still no faith? He said, crying in the morning, he said. And then he even told me what I was, I was eating a dosa for breakfast, he said, eating dosa from the side of your mouth, like this. <laughs> and he even imitated how I was eating it. Then I asked him, Swami, how, how did you see me eating that breakfast? You know, I joked with him. Mm -hmm. And he said, hmm? I have a thousand eyes. I have a thousand eyes. Even when I don't look, I look. Very important for people to hear who are longtime devotees of Sri Satya Sai Baba, who have never found the wherewithal to get to India, who have never had Baba cub to them in a dream, who have never felt an inner dialogue, perhaps. They should never he is with you. He is with you. He is with you. He is with you. He is with you as you at this very moment. He is, it's through you, through him you listen. It's because of him you understand. It is because of him you speak. It is because of him you are at a certain place. It is because of him you fail. It is because of him you suffer. It is because of him you gain. It is all him. He knows exactly because it is not a him, it, he is not separate from you, he's actually you. And I can say that and I, I know to you it means only words to some of you who are listening to this, but I want you to just have faith in that. Have faith that at this point, from this point on, he, you're not alone, you're never alone. Because the one that has sent you the one that has given you this breath, the one that has, has, is with you, he is never, he will never leave you. He, you are in his lap constantly, even while living this life. You never left his lap. And, and to look for him is, is our suffering till we realize that we were just all this time when we looked for him, we were sitting on his lap. And it seems to me it takes maybe two seconds to change your thoughts to accommodate that view but holding that view is where the challenge is. Holding that view is difficult because we are constantly afraid. We lack, Swami always says a very important thing, Atma Vishwas, it's, Atma Vishwas means self-confidence. We lack, we have so much confidence in what you think of me, what you think of me, what you think of me, but we have no confidence in our own selves. We are lacking confidence in our own selves and that is why this thought is not constantly in you. Once you start giving yourself the priority, yourself the priority, not your desires your priority, not your welfare your priority, not tomorrow, okay, I prayed to God so my tomorrow should be perfect. It's not going to be, I'm telling you right now, my life is not perfect. So how does my neighbor, is, how do is, I discern between my desires and myself, the age old question? How do you? You, first of all, 
you, your love for God must be true from inside. See, how do you reach to that love of God? You realize when you wake up every day, when each one of us, when we are telling each other, look, I'm not happy with myself. That's what we are telling each other. I'm not happy with my everyday. I'm not happy being alone with myself. I want to go out, go out and meet people because we are scared to be alone. You have to contemplate. We are not contemplating deep enough. Why am I afraid? Why do I look for friends? Why do I look for company? Why do I look for money? Why do I look for fame? Because I'm not happy with myself. And who is this? I that is not happy with myself, then you will accumulate the data. That I is that, that likes this and doesn't like this, that wants this and doesn't want this, that wants to walk this path and still walk this path. You cannot walk two paths. You cannot have one foot in London and one foot in America at the same time. Both your feet have to be somewhere. You cannot have one foot falling spirituality and the other foot you have a different image and you're walking. You cannot do that. You have to have self-respect. Self-respect means you have to be that one person to yourself that you respect constantly at all times with everyone, at all times with that same love. We constantly change and flicker. We don't have self-respect. Because we don't have self-respect, we don't have self-confidence. Because we have no self-confidence, we are giving un undue importance to other things in life, relationships, not that relationships are not, you have to do your duty. Baba says it's very important. Not that you should leave your mother on the streets, father on the streets, not take care of your, care of your spouse. No, no, no. That is very important. But while doing all that, you have to realize that whatever you do, you should be able to go home and be able to be comfortable with yourself. That is your self-respect. You have to be able to listen to yourself. That is self-confidence. And then taking that strength back, you have to again face those that you love, imparting that same thing to them, rather than just saying, Mom, I got you this gift, and Dad, Merry Christmas. That's not love. One of the keys is for a lot of people, from my own experience, is to observe frustration and fear uh, and disillusionment that comes with the fact that we have 24 hours in a day to fill. We can practice this for four hours, five hours, but then there comes nine o'clock at night or midnight or two o'clock in the morning Why? when you Why? awaken. Because you are again two eyes in you. Mm -hmm. There is one eye in you, Ted, that loves God. There is one eye in you, Ted, that cannot leave Ted, that cannot leave Ted's name, Ted's work. You cannot have both those eyes. That eye that you love to be has to face the eye that has to leave. And that eye that you so much want to, see we all want to lose our negativities, the characteristics, we all want to be free, but we're still not being able to be free, why? Because we are not confident enough that whether we can live without those thoughts, without those desires, without those things. So you have to be able to be, you have to have that confidence that the, the best part, Baba says, is sit with yourself and contemplate constantly. Catch yourself, catch your thought. Why did I think that? You have to be very, very aware. The reason you're getting tired of not being able to catch that is in the midst of your catching, you're going, you're being very attracted to your desires, what you want to do too. Mm -hmm. And you want to carry that little, cute little, good, 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 good Ted with that little desireful Ted. You can't do that. You cannot have good little Ted, Ted with <laughs> desireful Ted. Yeah. No. Good little Ted has to take desireful Ted, wring his neck, <laughs> and throw him out. <laughs> you see? And, and desireful Ted doesn't want that. Desireful Ted wants to make good friends with good little Ted. Mm -hmm. And they want to work together. And that doesn't work. Good little Ted and desireful Ted can't work together because one is going to kill the other. One has to kill the other. One has to swallow the other into him. My guess is that's what's so tremendously discouraging for most people I know, including myself. And that this, this, this real self, this higher self, this true self that you're talking about, to live there most of the day or most of one hour <laughs> seems to be nearly impossible. 
we, we are not trained to do that. We're not taught to do that. <laughs> because, because you're under the influence of the mind. The mind is very complex. It wants to be in several places at the same time. It wants to have a lot of security in all these several places that you want to have at the same time. But the self is very, very simple. It wants to be only in one place. It wants to be only with truth. Correct? So if the So now you when you are under the influence of the mind, at the same time, see you, you when you are trying to abolish the mind, as you say, mm -hmm. control the mind. Baba always says, don't control the mind, seeing as though that which you are thinking, another is thinking that. So you have to become so much of that truth. If you are loving Baba right now and you have that good Ted, the good Ted has to observe the desireful Ted as the other and not as a part of himself. Mm -hmm. And that separation comes with time. It doesn't come instantaneously, but it comes sadhana. Swami uses that word sadhana, sadhana, sadhana. Spiritual discipline, spiritual discipline. What is the greatest spiritual discipline? Catching your thoughts is the greatest spiritual discipline. How do you then, if you see yourself falling and you're watching your thoughts, you're getting caught up in a desire or obsession, you have to have this, mm -hmm. and you sense, oh my God, I know this is wrong. How do you get out of that? Because you have to, see, the, I'll tell you an example of mine, because I, 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 I wasn't born like that. I've gone through all these and I'm still going through it. I, I can now catch myself when I'm unhappy because I'm happy all the time. And I realize I am making myself unhappy. I am making myself unhappy. If you spoke to me hurtfully, and I am taking it personally, I am making myself unhappy. Not me, you no. are. Yeah, that's right. It is not what is going on outside. So what, what, what you have to do is you have to realize when you want something really badly, go to yourself, go to a mirror and look at yourself and see how relaxed you look. See if you have a smile on your face. <laughs> see if you can stand others around you that don't have the same desire. You won't be able to stand them. See if you can stand being by people who are trying to talk to you out of the desire. You'll feel a turbulence inside. You'll have defense mechanisms. You'll have unnecessary words. You will feel uncomfortable with yourself. When you feel uncomfortable with yourself, that is the best indication for you to realize that you have to stop because nothing is worth being uncomfortable with yourself. And how do you stop it? You have to realize that that which you're wanting is taking yourself away from you. If you're not happy now, how much more unhappier you're going to be when you have that? Let's see if you get that. Now you'll say, don't touch that. Let me put that higher up so no one touches it. Look how unhappy you became. Now your life became even worse. Now it broke. Now you have to lament on that. Okay? Then you have to blame someone on that. Then you have to use ugly words and actions with someone. Then you have to repent on that. Then you have to make up with that person. Then you have to overcome and let that thing go. So let that thing go when it came to you. <laughs> Why go through that whole horrible cycle? Right? We have... Uh, when, you, when you realize that you have been torturing yourself so f for so long, you have to catch, see, you have to become self-observant. Mm -hmm. We are very observant with our environments, but we are not self-observant. But that's asking a lot of individuals. It seems to me maybe in this one lifetime, people might come to the point where they start to realize the difference between when they're happy and when they're obsessed with pressure and fears and anxiety seems to me it would require a second lifetime to actually make that leap to move from that anxiety yeah. back to happiness. See, the problem is we educate ourselves so much of our environment. We educate ourselves to see how my mom was, how my dad was, how my husband was, how my kids were. But we rarely, if I ask you, how are you, you'll stumble and blabber and you won't know how to describe yourself. Mm -hmm. Why? because we don't think about how we are most of the times. You have to dissect and dissect. You have to be a spiritual scientist. You have to dissect yourself so much that it hurts you. Your little, that desireful eye is going to hurt. Mm -hmm. 
It's going to bleed. It's going to ask for mercy. It'll take all these beautiful angelic forms in front of you and say, look, I was only doing this because, and hmm. Don't listen to those songs either. The good Ted has to say, no, no, no. I, God doesn't find the need, need to speak. God seldom speaks. His silence speaks volumes. So we have to learn Truth to find is nothing but silence. the when God the, in us to yes. speak to us. There is no God in you. You are in God. God is not in you. God is in you, but you're in God, actually. When that dawned upon you truthfully and deeply, was it like a ton of bricks falling on your head? Was it like the world falling apart? No, it was joyful. I would. Uh, that's why I like to be alone, because I can be mad as ever. I can dance if I have to. <laughs> I can laugh if I have to. I can be that which doesn't need any specific characteristics. I have to go out now, so I have to say, hi, how are you? I don't have to be a robot like that. You can be I don't true have self. to key myself. I can see truth at all times, enjoy truth at all times, and not be afraid of untruth, because untruth is not untruth, actually. It's only a part of truth that's limited. That's all. So I, if I break the walls down, that person starts expanding either ways, and I feel the relief coming in that person instantly. You know, a lot of people watching you who hmm. say, that's Seema. Of course Seema can do it. That, Seema, Seema. I can't do that. How can other people learn to do this? How can other people learn how to be happy? Is that yes. what you're saying? <laughs> to be themselves, their true selves. You have to get up today, go to yourself, and ask yourself, who are you? Who am I? Am I the person that loves pasta? Am I the person that likes to sleep late? Am I the person that likes to go to a pub and drink? Am I the person that likes to work and earn a lot of money? Am I a person that likes to fight with my partners? Am I like, you have to ask yourself which, and you'll, you'll, you have to find how many categories. You'll realize there are so many eyes in you, and how many eyes you actually recognize in you. And the only way I can tell a person to reach this happiness is don't observe your environment as much as you observe yourself. Observe yourself. If you're at work and you get upset, ask yourself, why did I get upset? What is it in me that is getting upset? You will find a negative attitude in you. What is it that I'm expecting out of this environment for me to be happy? Is it right for me to expect that? Is it right for me that because I served her yesterday to get that return from that person immediately? Am I living for that person or am I living for myself? I am living for my true self. Why should I expect anything from another I that is already scattered all over the place? Correct? But in the real world, we create messes. You're at work one day and, you, mm -hmm. and, you, and your coworker upsets you and you say something that you know is harsh and you end up hurting that person's feelings and mm -hmm. then you feel awful about it. But you can't make that awful feeling that you caused in yourself to go away. How could you instantly separate You can go that? away because that I has to go away. See, you're holding on to that little I. That's why you're not feeling better. You're not feeling better because you're holding on to that little I. Talk to yourself. Say, was I? Okay, I said some rude words to this person. Correct? That person was hurt. Correct? Was I really that person that mm. spoke that? No, I had temporarily lost myself. <laughs> so now I have to take that I because that was the drunken part of me that let loose. I have to throw that drunkard out so he never messes with my awareness again. And now with my true self, I will go and apologize without feeling bad and without holding that against me because that was never the real me. Do you understand? Mm -hmm, I do. So you really have to work every day at separating you the You have to dissect. Eye. You have to take the cobweb. Sami used to tell me a very sweet thing when I was, um, as I had, um, you know, the most important part of Bhagwan's journey with me was this transformation and inner cleansing and the inner. I have enjoyed that so much, more than any ring and pendant and interview. I enjoy being with Swami. 24 hours a day because how do I, how am I with Swami? Because I'm aware of that little I and I dissect and I've become, I've enjoyed that. I, I'm enjoying dissecting that I and me. That has become my 
my number one job and I love it. And if I see it in anyone else, don't I start dissecting? I dissect <laughs> it because I want that person to be free. A lot of the people that are close to me first hurt with me, then they come back to me because they realize that I taught them to love themselves more than they actually were. And at that point, I may appear harsh. I may appear as a person that's critical, someone who's obsessive about truth, but I have to make them obsessive about truth. I cannot let them obsess in their fears. You have to obsess about truth. Sometimes love can be quite harsh to those of us who don't quite understand its truest meanings. For example, a friend posed uh, this question to me recently. If your son and your stranger, a stranger, if the two are both drowning, your son and a stranger, what does love command you to do? Which one do you save first? Whoever is worthy of continuing God's work more at that point, I would save that person. If you ask me that question, whoever is worthy to continue God's work and reach other minds more and teach that love, if it's not my son, I'll have to go to the other because I have to answer to him inside me. Mm -hmm. And I would be very unhappy if I answered and even if I saw my son, who was undeserving at that point to be saved, um, I don't think I would be able to find that, um, that free love. I would rather sacrifice that mm -hmm. and see his picture and say, thank you for giving up your life to save this person who is going to carry out Bhagwan's task. You, you tell us about plans or folly that uh, they're almost destined to fail. My, my daughter, Joanna, who's 26, told me a joke the other day that she said, Dad, do you want to make God laugh? Tell him your plans. God laughs all the time. Tell him your plans. So are we not, <laughs> That's to, very sweet. Are we not to plan to grow ourselves spiritually from the small eye, from all the eyes that we see about ourselves? See, when you say the word plan, you mean I'm going to think in a strategic manner so I can gain something back. Mm -hmm. That's not good. A lot of people approach spirituality that way. That's not good that because, because you're hurting yourself as you're beginning. But yes, if, you, if your plan, don't use the word plan. Swami doesn't use the word of plan. He uses effort. Effort means doing something without knowing where it's going to end. Mm -hmm. It may end into nothing. You did three days of something that nothing came out of. Wonderful. Baba told me to waste time. I wasted time. It was never a waste of time, you'll realize. In, at a certain point, that will turn back, that you learned something. So planning is something when you put effort and you're watching result at the same time you're gauging. And if you take off that result and work very hard, diligently in whatever you do, having love, killing your desires as you go, seeing the welfare of all equally, realizing that he's a witness, he's watching you. You will always do the right thing and you'll be fulfilled in your effort, even if you gain nothing out of it. You're saying that living in America where most people are raised to plan their futures, to work towards the success that's expected yes. of them, and yet we're talking about a spiritual destiny that's going to be there for everybody to uncover one day, that requires the most work of our life. Yes, so, that's so the how, difference. How do we balance the two? The diff. You see, the the. How do you balance the two? The most important thing that you have to do is you have to guide the youth. You have to guide children for this change of thinking to occur because the entire education system is failing this theory. And achieve, I can achieve, tell you, is what the, the, I can the tell you that. This what Baba has made me do in this life. He told me, be a good mother. Bring up your children with truth. See, that word truth enfolds so much in it. We think speaking truth, but when he said that, he imparts it to you, that instant. That instant I knew. I was not even married. I was 20 years old. I had gone with my mom on the death of my father to Puttaparthi to take my mother the first time to Puttaparthi because we saw him always in Bombay. When he told me for the first time, he came and he stared at me and I told my mom, I have to go and buy education and human values books for my children. It came out from my mouth. <laughs> and my mother, being a, um, a conservative Indian mother, was shocked. 
hearing this from my mouth. She said, you're not even married. <laughs> and you're talking about children. That is how he can impart. He had just passed me and given me a glance. Those children were born in his mind that time already. Mm -hmm. the, the mother Seema was born right that time when she had to still meet him five years later. And that whole picture of how I'm going to bring up my children had come to me instantly without even a marriage. These children speak volumes now when they go to school. The same teachers that educate them marvel at them. Why? Because they are able to follow the teachers. They are able to love their students. They are able not to take anything at heart. They are able to forgive anything that another student may tell them. They get along well with anybody, not because they are feeble, not because they are scared, but because they have the presence of God within them and they can see that God in each one and so they don't see anything personally. The same teachers that are teaching them are actually learning when they're teaching them. They may be teaching them math, but they're teaching them in their way of behavior how to be. Most of us can teach math, we can teach science, but we don't know how to be. Mm -hmm. And so they come and question me and ask me, how are your children like that? The teachers come and ask. So the answer to your question is, <clears throat> we have to go against the education system. We will have to stand against the education system because the education system is the result of our, uh, the education that we have, that parents have lost the proper responsibility towards their children and the children are going so outward that even the slightest mention of going inward is, is like either sarcastic joke or f like funny to them because even Karan and Krishna go through that. They go through sarcasm, they go through being put down. But then they come back home to me and say, you know what? The first thing they'll say, mommy, thank you for teaching us to be peaceful. Mm -hmm. Those are the words my 11 year olds come and tell me. Thank you for telling us, teaching us not to get angry. It's wonderful. Others are getting angry because we are not angry. <laughs> and we don't know how to fulfill their request. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> you become a, when you have yourself, you're the, you're the most successful person. When you're comfortable and happy with yourself, you're the most successful person. You may have everything in life. You may have people at your feet, but if you're not comfortable with yourself, it's of no use because you're going to doubt. At, you're not, you know, how many ever people are around you? Do you think you believe in them if you don't believe in yourself? Definitely not. You're questioning me today because you don't believe in me. That's why you're questioning <laughs> me today. That's a way of putting it. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Because my speaking with you was, is going to make you, if, if slightly, instead of disbelieving me, you believed in me, you're going to go inside. Why did you believe in me? There's a Ted that is like Seema that is alive in there. Mm -hmm. You remind me of somebody who thinks about how much guidance there is for 11-year-olds to go inside at all. I don't think there's any teacher in any public school that I know that teaches 11-year-olds or, or, or perhaps even most friends or neighbors who share with 50-year-olds the fruits of going inside, the value of going inside. Many people in our culture have to learn as if they're babies learning to crawl how to do that yes. it's not very easy yeah that, but it's very, no it's very easy because if i told you become a baby today look how many responsibilities of yours just went away <laughs> look how fearless you just became all you have to do is believe in the mother that's him that's god a baby is born and he believes only in his mother go back you have believed in your thought, in your dislikes, in your likes, in your wanting, in your not wanting, in this person, in that person. Erase that life and go back to babyhood. And you will giggle, you will laugh, you will feel tickled at untruth. You will feel you won't, f you, just like a baby that stares at someone who comes and shouts and screams and well, doesn't feel hurt. You will feel like that. You will feel exactly the same thing. The only thing. Baba's asking you to do is 
give those responsibilities, give those fears, give those thought processes and those planning that you have so much crammed in and you're saying, I'll take God's help. I'll take his help, but I'll also do it. I'm telling you, don't take his help. Let him do it. Don't take his help. <laughs> He's the doer. You have to just give it to him and then you will giggle like a child. And sometimes it seems to me you have to give it to him blindly, just on faith alone, because... See, you can't think and give it to him. That's contradictory. Just, just turn it over. How can you think and give it to him? Just you're not giving it to him. You may give me something when you're thinking you've not given it to me. You just gave it to me superficially. Somewhere along the line, he has taught me and, and other sources have taught me the same thought to give thanks in all things, for all things, all the time, especially the things that seem to hurt you, that seem to hurt you the most. Well, I try to practice that, and I feel like I'm a hypocrite. I feel like I'm completely stupid. Why am I giving thanks to things that I know hurt me? My answer to myself is because I know everything is in perfect divine order. Everything is for a reason, even if I don't understand it, even if it totally mystifies me, even if it hurts me. You mean you give things to people and it hurts you? I, I didn't get what you're saying. If I experience hurt hmm. for whatever reason, my first reaction has been to teach myself to give thanks to God okay. for everything in life, including the hurt. Help me with this a little bit. I don't have to understand why that's helping me, why that's teaching that's me or building me. That's wonderful, though. But, but my, my conviction is that it does build you. Mm -hmm. Everything builds you. You surrendered. When you said, thank you, God, you surrendered to Him. You said, you gave me a bitter medicine right now, and you know what? It is for my good. Thank you. Even if you don't understand the purpose behind the medicine. Even, you, why do you need to understand? Does a mother, child need to understand why the mother went to the kitchen? Why she heated up the bottle? He just drinks the milk. Mm -hmm. Why do you need to understand everything? So when you I'm, say turn everything over to God, you mean everything, including these hardships. Everything, these, these, even what you're going to eat next, whether you're going to eat dinner next or not. And do you do whether this? Whether you have to wear shoes on your way to a restaurant or not. And do you do this? Yes, you have to. That's how you're happy. And how do you know you get the right response? Because Baba. I know I'm full. For, it'll just come to me without a thought. It mm -hmm. won't come to the thought. It'll come. When you get a thought, you're hurried. Can others start doing this? Yes, Can instantly. Can they start today? Yes, you have to laugh. You have to learn how to <laughs> laugh first. You have to laugh at yourself first. And if you laugh at yourself first, then you won't hurt as much. When you don't hurt as much, you'll learn a lot. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go visit somebody who's not feeling well and her name is Mary one day mm. and you ask, Your heart will should, tell should you I go to visit Mary or should I, should I go to visit Jane? They're both hurting. They could both use my company and I could, they could then both you have, it. see. When, <laughs> so Baba, which should I go visit? When, when you're doing that, there, <laughs> there's usually an in, incentive for, re, for visiting both because when it is your true self telling you, you will be wearing your chapels, putting on your car, and telling your husband, I am driving towards this, and I think I may be going there, but I'll let you know. <laughs> don't I tell you that sometimes? You I don't think, know in process. I think I may be going to there. that store, but I don't know. <laughs> but just go this way, take the street. Come on, does that really happen? Oh, sure. Yes. All, All the time. Day. We live like that. <laughs> Do you ever surprise yourself and end up uh, arriving no, at don't. another destination? No, sometimes it's nothing. I did nothing. We drove and came back. I said, I, okay. I asking where we're going. Yeah. <gasps> So, um, a lot of people would say that's crazy. It's not crazy. It, see, what is to me crazier is this complexity of, let me go and meet Mary today. Let me give her these fruits. She'll be so pleased if I visit her from six to seven. For me, that is madness. Mm -hmm. Because I know I don't love Mary. I thought so much before going. It is only for an hour I'm going to give myself to her. Then I'll return myself back. Mm -hmm. No, that's not true love. You go, sp love is spontaneous. Love is so spontaneous. Have you seen Swami doing some things? Have you seen Swami during that Very shot? spontaneous. Has Swami very planned? No. No plans. He'll come to the veranda, he'll go inside. What? Then you're watching your guru do that. You're watching your own spiritual teacher do that. So you're really saying He's we should learn to live life spontaneously. Live life spontaneously. The You'll plans. be happy. Not irresponsibly. Mm -hmm. Spontaneity is not irresponsibility. You don't say, I'm going to leave my kids. I'm spontaneous. I felt like going to a bar. No, no. Now, that's when you use your understanding and intellect. Mm -hmm. But don't use your understanding and intellect too much into what you're going to gain into doing something. Mm -hmm. What am I going to get out of it? I should go and do this. She'll feel happy. No. Are you happy to go see her? Then go see her. Mm -hmm.
she's she's expecting me we haven't gone to see her everyone else has gone to see her that's not good mm -hmm. you never went to see mary f see mary you weren't happy because you planned so much you get up and say i have to go see mary that is going and seeing mary mm -hmm. i must go see mary because she's sick that is going and seeing mary and because to learn you the did it for yourself to learn the difference between the two yes it seems like we have to learn every day how love to is spontaneous Lo planning is not love. You planning is manipulative love in what you're going to get from everyone when you do that. You know, your, your children are going to the same school I went to as in grade school, and I, I swear it was back in the sixth or seventh grade at St. Paul's School in North Canton, Ohio, when I had a, uh, a favorite nun stand up one day and tell us all, everything you do is calculated for your own ego to benefit yourself. <laughs> See? Everything you do. Mm. Now, that, that was almost impossible for us to understand. Mm -hmm. It's and true. I'm not quite sure why I still remember it today. It's true. But I, but I thought, could it be true that every good act we do? Everything you do with the closest person you do, it's for your own benefit. How do you break out of that? <laughs> That's what's called attachment. That's what Baba calls attachment and detachment. Detachment is still serving that person without having any awareness of intent. We always have an awareness of intent deep, deep, deep inside. Even if you say, come on, Ted, it's time to go to sleep. It's because you're tired too. Does that go There's for an people, intent. Does that go for people doing wonderful seva programs? Yes. Oh, yeah. See, feeding I, the poor, visiting there is, the people. Swami at the always says, the poor is feeding the rich. <laughs> there is no feeding the poor. Swami always tells me, go feed the rich. Become richer and come back. These Never medical say camps feeding the poor. doctors and nurses and volunteers throw, that's not worthy seva. That but aren't they charging? Isn't he making a good, good salary? <laughs> Doesn't he have this home? He's, he's earning a lot with that. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not going home every day because he loves his patients. So how do we find the correct seva that isn't self-serving? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> She's speaking in general terms. <laughs> how do we find the correct seva that doesn't end up being selfish seva? You have to start, you start seva because you're selfish. Mm -hmm. You don't start seva because you're selfless. You only do seva because you're selfish and you're, but the good thing is, the good thing is you're aware of your selfishness. Okay? That is why you're different from another person who's not serving. You're better from another person that is completely not serving because he's not even aware of his selfishness. So, Swami says there's one good thing that is there, but that good thing is only the initial spark. It's on that first second that you said, let me go and do something. You know, what am I doing at home? But we hold on to that one second of a thought throughout the stretch of the whole save and say, look how much we do, look what it we don't realize that we are actually, we are becoming aware of selflessness, but becoming more selfish while doing seva. So it's, it's very tricky. It's, it's mm. so close. And you have to be very truthful to yourself to recognize that mm -hmm. in you. Most people cannot dig that deep. See, usually when I dig with a, to the people I love, usually they hurt very fast. I know the level of, but when Swami digs and you start getting very close, when you start loving truth so much so that you're becoming part of the truth, you start liking to dig. Simu, we have only a couple of minutes left. <laughs> Let me just ask a couple of final questions to serve as examples for other people to learn how to discover the big eye and, and get rid of the many smaller eyes inside of them. And you learn by talking, by maintaining a dialogue with God, by talking to Baba. In your case, for example, today, can you share with us so people might have a practical lesson that they can learn from? How is Baba directing you today? Or how did he direct you yesterday? What was the conversation, recent conversation I mm -hmm. had? The recent conversation I had at Bhagwan was at three o'clock in the afternoon. I was reading a book and Swami said to me very sweetly, it's good to make a fool of yourself sometimes. And that little eye in me became a little aware. Am I going to? <laughs> what is it, Swami? Why did you say that? And Swami said, 
it is extremely important because most of the times you give yourself a lot of understanding when you're alone with yourself and you don't and hence you're not able to catch that little eye that was big and is growing smaller but as it starts growing smaller you negate it and you start saying I don't have that little eye anymore I think I'm spiritual and so Swami said it's good it's good to be outside sometimes with other people who have their little eyes that can catch your little eyes <laughs> and make a fool of you on the outside <laughs> so that when you're experiencing that you're becoming a fool you're realizing that that little eye that is hurting in you that's what I have to catch when they leave so it keeps you grounded it keeps you grounded it, it's very important to have that interaction with other minds not to blame them but for them to see for you for them to see you as they see you not as you see yourself and perhaps one of the last one or two questions might be aimed at the people who are brand new to Sri Satya Sai Baba who might be visiting a friend on this evening when somebody popped in a videotape of an interview from a Sai Baba devotee whose name is Seema Dewan and they end up feeling as if the message is being aimed at their heart and they didn't have any interest coming through the front door nor intention that this might be the case what can you say to somebody who might catch who might be caught off guard that there is more to life than all the many small all I eyes can, I can say to them as he has come to you today he has come so blatantly and truly to you today if you are feeling anything in your heart if you have even made contact with his picture if you have read even a teaching of his if you have met even a devotee of his stick on to that person stick on to that book stick on to whatever you're looking at because he has come to you today and he has given a promise that whoever my eyes are set on I will transform that person if you have faith in that one sentence that he has said you will change you will die while you're alive and you will live with God and and for those newcomers who quite aren't ready yet at this moment in time to accept Sai Baba fully but their interest is peaked and they believe in God and they want to advance themselves spiritually does the same thing yes, apply same. to them? Yes, same. God is with you. God can have any name. I say Baba because it is through Him that I learned how to live with my heart fully with my heart and that God is in every living being there is not a single living being that comes without that spark of light you are with that spark of light and that light is being ignited and you're becoming aware of that light today and if you're becoming aware of that light today I would say go and make it a huge bonfire go and dig deep whichever religion whichever path you have to go but go find God because God is the only way God is not a form of worship God is happiness God is love God is peace and 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 God is being um, is is gives you a totally new meaning of respect from the worldly respect meaning it's a fullness that you can never experience with anything or anyone in this life Seema thank you very much thank you Sai Ram <laughs>